This conference will now be recorded. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Microwave Engineering Revision classes for third year uh, EC A and B. Myself, uh, G.V. Sachkumar, Associate Professor, Department of ECE. Uh, this uh, Microwave Engineering uh, is a UG course and for the third years. And in this uh, revision class, we are going to cover about three units, unit one, two, three. Uh, the first unit consists of uh, a basic uh, uh, microwave applications and what is a rectangular waveguide and different modes of uh, uh, analysis of uh, microwave transmission lines. Let us uh, start our discussion uh, with uh, microwave definition. What are microwaves? Microwaves are basically electromagnetic radiation with wavelengths ranging from about one meter to one millimeter with frequencies between 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz. That means microwaves are having very small wavelength. The micro refers to wavelength. Okay, so uh, sometimes microwave range, uh, maybe they, they define from one gigahertz to thousand gigahertz also. So we may refer uh, different literature where you can find the primarily the microwave range is around 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz or they may vary to 1 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz and these microwave frequencies are categorized into different band designations according to IEEE as S, C, X, K, U, K and K bands. Now when you look at the, micro, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum uh, see when you are going from when you are going from uh, uh, to a left hand side longer the wavelengths and you, if you go for right hand side you are having shorter wavelengths and your radio frequencies are on a longer wavelength side and your microwave frequencies are at shorter wavelength side and you can see what are the different applications of your microwaves you can see here they are used for radar communication and one commercial application you can see here is microwave woven. So like this, we can use microwave uh, for commercial purposes as well as uh, for uh, military applications also. Let us see what are the different uh, uh, band designations we are having at RF frequencies. Now, if you see this table, the range of frequencies which are categorized here are from three to three hedges to up to three exa hedge, 30 exa hedge. Now, what is our main focus uh, uh, of frequencies here is look at uh, this range around uh, uh, 300 to uh, 3000 megahertz, categorized as ultra high frequency. And 3 to 30 gigahertz is uh, categorized as super high frequency SHF. And 30 to 300 gigahertz as extra high frequency EHF. Later on, uh, these uh, band designations are converted into microwave range into IEEE band designations. So in this IEEE band designations, you can see the name of band is a little bit changed. And th these are the bands which we are popularly using for designating your microwave frequencies. See, HF is nothing but high frequency, which is in, in order of megahertz. And if you look at uh, the various uh, band frequencies uh, starting from one gigahertz, so L band starts at one to two gigahertz, S band is two to four gigahertz, C band is four to eight gigahertz, X band is eight to twelve gigahertz. K U K K band they will range around uh, twelve gigahertz to forty gigahertz. Now, if you look at uh, these bands. These bands are commonly occurring when you are uh, watching your satellite TV. So, suppose if you go for a, uh, your uh, 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 cable guy and ask you what kind of uh, receiver you are using, he will say that we are using C band receiver, meaning that he was using your satellite TV in the range of four to eight gigahertz. And uh, if you look at different satellites which are launched inside 4A, inside 5A, like that, if you look at they are operating around the KUK and KA bands also. And uh, the frequencies which are above 40 gigahertz, whose wavelengths are in order of millimeters, they are called as millimeter waves. And they have special applications also. 
and uh, the frequencies uh, whose uh, wavelengths are still smaller than millimeter they are called as sub millimeter waves whose frequencies are greater than 300 gigahertz now we will uh, look at uh, some of the applications uh, of your rf frequency band designations for a better understanding uh, how these uh, applications influence our daily life so vlf is very low frequency it is in order of kilo hedges and uh, uh, ground wave propagation it uses and application for this is long range radio navigation lf low frequency it is also in order of a few hundred kilo hedges and utilizes ground wave propagation and uh, uh, main applications are radio beacons and navigational locators like um, say for example any uh, any small boat uh, uh, in the ocean can communicate using lf and uh, mf middle frequency is uh, 300 kilo hedges to 3 mega hedges using skyway propagation and the uh, main application is am you know that a means amplitude modulation and uh, hf frequency is also using skyway propagation and it is used for uh, the various applications which are listed here now vhf very high frequency 30 to 300 megahertz utilizing sky uh, uh, skyway propagation as well as line of sight propagation uh, the main applications are starting here where you can uh, uh, look at uh, uh, the main uh, generally used uh, uh, communications vhf tv when you uh, open your uh, tv for settings you can see that we are operating with different uh, uh, satellite channels in vhf vhf as well as uhf and this particular we had a very high frequency uh, uh, the same uh, frequency band we are using for fm radio communication also similarly if you go for uhf ultra high frequency now we are starting to going into your microwave range 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz this uh, ultra high frequency uses a line of sight communication line of sight communication is also called as point to point communication and uh, the main applications in this range is UHF TV, your um, mobile phones, paging. Uh, in olden days, we used to go for paging devices, special uh, paging devices. But nowadays, we are using SMSs, right? And uh, we go for uh, satellite communication where some of your uh, uh, popular TV channels uh, we are using in this UHF range only. And uh, uh, later, we'll go for another high frequency called as super high frequency SHF, which is ranged around 3 to 30 gigahertz. Again, line of sight communication. It is popular with satellite communication. And uh, finally, uh, the last one is EHF, extra extremely high frequency around uh, 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz line of sight communication uh, applications are your radar and satellite. Now, these band designations are very important uh, 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 because you, you know what are the different daily applications we are coming across in these ranges please remember these applications which are important for your examination also now coming to what are the different applications of microwaves microwave uh, signals are basically used as carrier signals and uh, uh, because of uh, the uh, microwave signals are high frequency signals in most of the cases we are using them as uh, carrier signals so let us see some of the applications uh, industrial applications as well as uh, military applications say first the uh, first application is telecommunication application in telecommunication application first one is we are using for uh, radio where um, a small boat can communicate with the uh, land something like that wireless uh, sets we can go for it so for all those purposes we can use your microwave frequencies and the second uh, one is intercontinental telephone system intercontinental telephone system means we are communicating between one country to another country that inter that is called as inter intercontinental telephone system and your satellite tv for satellite tv communication we can use it and for space communication earth to space or uh, uh, from uh, space to earth say for example you want to observe an asteroid or you want to observe different planets or if you want to um, uh, communicate with a satellite from the ground station 
for all those things comes under space communication so in satellite communication your uh, microwave signal is used as a carrier they are called as microwave communication links and in um, railways also for com uh, for uh, departmental communications they are using telemetry communication links for railways so these are the uh, important uh, 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 applications of your uh, microwaves in telecommunication area and another popular military as well as civilian application is radar why i said military and uh, uh, civilian is nowadays uh, radar became uh, so so much commercialized we are using for uh, peace applications also say for example radar detect aircraft so uh, we can uh, use this uh, detect aircraft radar uh, say for example we can use it for uh, monitoring your uh, airport uh, flights whether the, how they are landing how, and we can control the traffic uh, like that our military application it comes under traffic and guide supersonic missiles similarly uh, similarly we can use a, a doppler radar to observe and track weather patterns all these uh, uh, things comes under microwave uh, signal as a carrier application only so another popular uh, application we come across is police speed detectors burglar alarms garage door openers etc now as you know that microwave shows uh, uh, refraction as well as uh, uh, reflection properties quasi optical in nature and when the microwaves are passed through some materials they are dissipated as heat so this heating property of microwaves are used for several commercial applications one such example of commercial application is microwave oven which we are daily using uh, for cooking and another application is industrial application is drying machines say for example in the textile industry so when you are dyeing new clothes we need to dry them up uh, uh, so for that purpose we are using microwaves uh, incubating chambers so that uh, that paint uh, or uh, dye will be cured in a, within a short interval of time and uh, similarly in food industry say potato chips uh, when you want to uh, go for oil less potato chips we will bake them so for baking uh, your uh, potato chips we are using microwave ovens and in printing industry to dry up inks we are using microwaves similarly in uh, food processing industry especially when you want to store food like meat or food grains we are going uh, we are using uh, microwaves pre cooling pre cooking say for example you are uh, uh, eating the pre cooked noodles right when you want to go go for a shop and uh, buy noodles just add a uh, hot water you can eat directly so that kind of applications where pre cooking involved we can use microwaves and similarly in uh, uh, industries where milk uh, products are used in order to pasteurize your milk products we can use microwaves pasteurization or sterilization purpose and heat frozen slash refrigerated pre cooled meats what is this uh, thing means is so sometimes we need uh, uh, your meat to be cooked uh, ready to eat uh, meat uh, we require or sometimes we need to store your meat in a vacuum uh, vacuum packet so before going uh, for a vacuum sealing what they will do is they will sterilize this meat using microwaves or they will cook this meat with micro uh, microwave chambers and then they will go for vacuum sealing so the product will last for 2 to 3 years without any uh, uh, spoiling similarly uh, roasting of food grains or beans say for example uh, look at uh, your coffee how your coffee is made so coffee we are uh, made from grains coffee beans we will take it to roast them and the quality of coffee depends on how you are roasting those beans coffee beans so we can use a mic uh, microwaves to generate this uh, uh, roasting of this food grains in a controlled way in such a that uh, the quality of uh, coffee will be high right so like this uh, in the different uh, industries we are using microwave heating property for different applications and another application industrial application is rubber industry plastic industry when you want to go generate uh, different rubber and say, say say for example tire industry in tire industry uh, uh, there is a threading 
for the tire right so in order to make this uh, uh, raw tire into having a threads we are using microwaves and those microwave chambers are used to uh, used in uh, rubber industry so that it melted and pasted onto the uh, main wheel frame so uh, like that we can use it chemical industry and the forest product industries say wood pulp industry where we want to generate uh, we want to make um, uh, paper from using wood pulp so like that in different areas uh, we are using microwaves and uh, uh, another uh, very important application is public works where microwaves are, uh, you, uh, microwaves are used to break up whole seams or curing cement so as i said before uh, microwaves are used for uh, drying in uh, drying or sterilizing drains or drying or uh, 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 sterilizing pharmaceuticals so when you are manufacturing medicine so uh, say for example if i manufacture medicine in different uh, forms i can use a syrup or i can use a tablet but when you want to go for a tablet i need to make uh, uh, that medicine in, into a particular shape so when you are want to make it it should be in a hygienic environment so if i want to dry up your tablets in the outer atmosphere weather it may be contaminated so we are using microwave chambers uh, so that we can make these medicines in a hygienic uh, manner and dry these uh, particular uh, medicines drying textiles and another industry which requires uh, this uh, uh, drying process is leather industry so leather quality leather bags or whatever the leather products you are seeing in the market the quality of the leather depends on how it is dried so when you, when you dry it in a controlled way suppose in winter season when you dry it the moisture levels are high and the quality of your leather is different from uh, when you dry in summer so uh, but the industry has to work throughout the year but the quality should not change so in those cases we use uh, uh, microwave chambers to heat up these uh, leather uh, uh, products in such a way that the quality remains same and another interesting industry is tobacco industry so tobacco industries where, where cigarettes are manufactured or different products are manufactured again the quality of your product depends on uh, how you are drying the tobacco leaves so microwave chambers can be used in such a way that the tobacco leaves are uh, dried up in a controlled way so that uh, the nicotine levels in the leaves will not be damaged so like this we can see uh, several uh, applications for your microwaves and another uh, interesting area where microwaves are used is biomedical applications uh, for example cancer treatment so cancer treatment cancer uh, uh, tumors uh, uh, once they are formed uh, it is advanced stage then doctors will go, not going for operating so what they will do is uh, they will use microwaves heating property to uh, uh, remove that particular or uh, to burn the area in uh, where this uh, uh, tumor is present so in cancer treatment we are using microwaves uh, for superficial heating and another uh, uh, another application where you can use uh, your uh, microwaves in the medical application is kidney stones so suppose if, when you want to break uh, if, uh, if your kidney stone is larger than 5 mm or 10 mm then uh, we can use microwaves to break that uh, kidney stone into smaller pieces so that they can be treated with uh, uh, medicines right so like that non invasive methods for uh, treating patients uh, in uh, 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 biomedical cases we can use microwaves and the another uh, important one is hyperthermia hyperthermia is nothing but when you go into freezing temperatures the body temperature will fall down so if i want to restore the body temperature we can use microwave therapy in a in such a way that the body temperature of the patient will be uh, increased in a controlled manner and um, the last one is monitoring of heartbeat say for example at some uh, in one area due to uh, earthquake a person trapped in under the debris so if i want to know uh, whether a person trapped under the debris or not how can i know that either uh, the ndrf persons will use dogs to identify whether persons are trapped inside or not or the person has to scream if the person is unconscious but alive how can you know that so we can use uh, microwaves for uh, 
identifying heartbeat and identify person in a non contact means so monitoring of heartbeat or lung water detection purposes also we can use microwaves and another uh, war time application of your microwaves is electronic warfare ecm or eccm ecm means electronic counter measure and eccm means electronic counter counter measure electronic counter measure you may not be aware of it but if i say it's jammer then everybody identified so jammer is used you know what purpose jammers are used they are used to block unwanted uh, signals right so for that purpose we can use uh, ecm technology that means 10 volts in microwaves as i said before the microwaves can be used to identify objects or persons by non contact methods now from applications we know that microwaves are uh, having a vast area of uh, uh, applications so it is very uh, so useful to understand how these microwaves are propagated how they are generated all those things now look at uh, what are the advantages of microwaves compared to low frequencies the first advantage is availability of launch bandwidth as a frequency increases a frequency is directly proportional to bandwidth as frequency increases bandwidth availability is also increases when you use uh, microwaves as a carrier we can send a lot of data so large uh, bandwidth availability makes us to uh, communicate uh, uh, effectively as well as uh, send more data and another application is as the frequency is higher we are having better directive properties that means we can able to focus the microwaves uh, over a smaller region by using a smaller antenna so the beam width that can be produced is very small that's why your microwave uh, technology is popular with your satellite communication because your satellite is around uh, 36000 kilometers away having a 5 meters or 1 meter radius antenna and we are able to focus your microwave beam from the earth uh, station antenna to uh, the uh, satellite antenna which is very small com compared to the distance 36000 kilometers away and as the frequency increases the size of the antenna is also reduces as the microwaves uh, uses line of sight communication automatically the power consumption is also reduces and another advantage uh, with the line of sight communication is less fading effects so with all these advantages microwave communications became popular in point to point links okay now uh, before going to uh, the further applications or uh, for a next topic if you have any doubts you can ask me in the chat box no doubts okay we will move further now let us go to the uh, next topic wave guides so what are wave guides how where they are used what are the applications of your wave guides wave guide is nothing but a hollow metallic tube uh, having a uniform cross sectional area which is able to transmit electromagnetic waves by successive reflections so uh, when you want to uh, go for microwave transmission we can uh, either go for unguided transmission or we can go for guided transmission so microwaves, uh, if we want to go for guided transmission at higher frequencies, we use wave guides. The main advantage of uh, wave guides are, wave guides are easy to manufacture. It's a relatively, we can say that they are easy to manufacture because there are only fixed number of shapes are present. So uh, they can be manufactured easily. They can handle very high powers in kilowatts of power we can able to transmit but normal transmission lines they cannot handle kilowatts of power and uh, as micro uh, wave guides are efficient to for propagating higher frequencies from one point to another point uh, the power losses are also negligible they offer very very low losses now let us look at the different kinds of uh, wave guides available with us uh, say if, uh, look at uh, this particular diagram see we are having rectangular waveguide this is your rectangular waveguide 
uh, it is having a cross section area this one this is called as a flange where you can connect the different kinds of waveguides together to form a longer waveguide and another type of uh, waveguide uh, uh, that is known to us is circular waveguide and uh, uh, another type is elliptical waveguide like this elliptical shape and single rigid waveguide or double rigid waveguide this is a special type of waveguides uh, mm -hmm. we can see how the structure or uh, cross sectional area is present this is a rigid type this one and this is a flexible type of rigid waveguide now let us uh, look at uh, the main differences between a transmission line and a waveguide a two conductor structure that can support a tm transverse electromagnetic wave uh, is a transmission line as you see in the picture we are having two lines so it is called as a general transmission line and your waveguide is a, a single conductor so uh, a one conductor structure that can support a te or tm wave but not tem wave please remember i have highlighted that uh, your rectangular waveguide do not support tem wave propagation so uh, when you have a waveguide like this and it is not connected to anything uh, uh, this side then we should not call this one as open circuit because it is a single conductor so rather we will call it as open ended waveguide what is called as it is called as open ended waveguide now let us see some differences between a transmission line and a waveguide so the waveguide is a hollow metallic structure through which electric and magnetic fields are transmitted or electromagnetic signal is transmitted and the transmission line is a conductor which is used to carry electrical signals for longer range this manufacturing concept is basically a relative concept whether the shapes are uh, simple or not based on that we can say that waveguides are very simple to manufacture and the transmission lines there are different kinds of transmission lines coaxial lines like that twisted pairs like that so the complexity in the manufacturing may be present uh, in the uh, waveguide side waveguides can handle more power compared to a normal transmission line the general operating modes for your uh, uh, waveguides are te or tm modes and the transmission lines are operated uh, using a tm mode a tm or quasi tm mode okay so in waveguide the electromagnetic signal is transmitted in a transmission line the electrical signal is transmitted generally the waveguides are operated at higher frequencies and your transmission lines are operated relatively at low frequencies now we are going to rectangular waveguide how it functions what are the different modes present in a rectangular waveguide a rectangular waveguides are the one of the earliest type of transmission lines so what is a waveguide waveguide is basically a transmission line okay so your waveguide rectangular waveguide supports t tm modes but not tm mode again again i'm mentioning this point so that you can register this particular point a rectangular waveguide supports tm and te modes but not tm wave propagation and uh, coming to the modes uh, we are having three different types of modes uh, one is a te mode and another one is tm mode and third one is tm mode what is a te mode te mode uh, this waveguide mode is dependent upon the transverse electric waves also sometimes called as h waves characterized by the fact that electrical vector e being always perpendicular to the direction of propagation so simply ez is equal to 0 and hz is may not be 0 and the tm mode of propagation is where your ez is equal to 0 and uh, sorry ez not equal to 0 and hz is equal to 0 for a tm mode of propagation remember that both ez and hz are non zero now let us go to how this particular rectangular waveguide works 
so when a electromagnetic wave want to travel in a rectangular wave gate it has to satisfy some criteria what is that criteria is the rectangular wave gate offers very low attenuation for the frequencies which are above certain frequency called as cutoff frequency so already we have seen these advantages and where uh, what are the different uses of your uh, rectangular wave guide uh, we can use uh, this rectangular wave guide as a high pass filter this is one important one uh, rectangular wave guide can act as a high pass filter and uh, here uh, we are showing different types of wave guide components rectangular wave guide how it looks like and different uh, waveguide bends that can be used for uh, connecting a network and this is waveguide to coaxial uh, adapter where we can convert one kind of uh, transmission system into another type uh, that means uh, you can give input to uh, from a coaxial cable to a waveguide or you can take output from a waveguide to a coaxial line and this is another uh, component called as a uh, e plane t junction and uh, these are the different uh, wave guides we can have so see carefully here this particular one and uh, this one carefully observe what is happening to the cross sectional area please uh, give your answer in the chat box what you have observed in this so when you look at uh, this particular uh, wave guide see the cross sectional area is decreased from this point to this point see cross sectional area is reduced so this kind of uh, wave guides are used as impedance transformers or they can be used as filters also so when you want to buy a wave guide okay according to the cross sectional areas we are uh, giving a uh, wave guide designations so wr means wave guide rectangular this 975 number tells about the dimensions of the wave guide see wr90 is a popular wave guide which we are using in the laboratory so wr90 means if you uh, the dimensions are 0.9 inches and uh, by 0.45 inches and it can be operated around 8.2 to 12.4 gigahertz that means x band of frequency range now a rectangular wave guide as i said before it supports te and tm mode propagation and it will not support tem mode propagation so we are having the uh, de mode designations as temn what is m subscript stands for is m subscript stands for half wave variations of the field in x direction n subscript stands for half wave variations in the y direction now look at a, a, a parallel uh, plate wave guide how the modes are uh, looking at so if you see so t uh, parallel plate means only Uh, two x direction or y direction is confined not uh, four directions so uh, t1 means m is equal to 1 where you are having a electric field maximum here and uh, for m is equal to 2 you are having a null point at the middle and at m is equal to 3 we are having null points uh, two null points here as you said okay and uh, in a rectangular wave guide how this um, t10 mode field electric field pattern looks like you can see so electric field pattern along the broader wall and it is maximum at the middle please remember this pattern and for t20 we are having a null point at the middle so we are having two maximum points here okay similarly for t30 we are having one point here 
and another maximum here another maximum here and we are having null points here and uh, these are the different uh, field patterns of uh, different modes electric field modes in the rectangular wave grid you can see the color stands for different uh, fields how their strength is varying and your uh, magnetic field is present uh, in, uh, in loops and your electric fields are present in like this okay now this is the configuration your e field and your magnetic fields are like this in loops these are the another uh, figure showing a uh, te and tm modes so we are summarized all the types of uh, modes that are possible in our uh, maximum modes possible in rectangular wave guide and how they are looking te10 te11 te21 just look at uh, these figures now we will go uh, for uh, mathematical analysis of uh, these modes uh, from maxwell's equations del cross e is equal to minus j omega mu h that can be derived from that we, we are getting three equations and from del cross h is equal to j omega epsilon e another three equations we will get now we will uh, solve the field components already you have done this just look at the uh, once uh, how we are doing this so we will solve ex and uh, hy components from that we will get all the field components as ey is equal to 1, one by gamma square where gamma is your propagation constant this is alpha stands for your attenuation constant and beta stands for phase constant so ex ey hx hy now if you see all these uh, field components the field components are either present either ez hz they are present in ez and hz suppose if you put ez is equal to 0 hz equal to 0 simultaneously what will happen all the field components will vanish so uh, when all field components are vanish meaning that no longer that particular signal will exist in the rectangular wave guide that means e z equal to 0 h z equal to 0 that is tm mode does not exist in our rectangular wave guide all components will vanish that means only te or tm modes will exist in rectangular wave guide now let us look at uh, the wave equation tm mode so already we have derived uh, this particular uh, tm mode analysis just uh, look at these equations and uh, recollect uh, how we have executed this particular tm mode analysis take to one minute time to look at the equations so we, we are assumed initially the field component ez as capital x into capital y where capital x is a function of only small x and capital y is only function of small y and later we manipulated the equation in such a way that it will be in the form of differential equation so the generalized solution for this kind of differential equations will be uh, yes uh, sin x plus b cos x so we assumed the coefficients and uh, 
we got the general uh, solution as e z is equal to a sin mx plus b cos mx into c sin ny plus d cos ny. Now we will solve uh, these equations for these coefficients m, n, a, b, c, d by using boundary conditions. So when you, there are four boundary conditions, one is x equal to zero and another one is x equal to a and uh, z is y equal to zero and y equal to b where your uh, conducting walls are present. Now by applying these four boundary conditions, we will arrive uh, at a conclusion that your propagation constant or phase constant uh, is a uh, like this square root of uh, omega square epsilon mu minus n pi by a whole square minus n pi by a whole square. Now, as you know that your uh, rectangular waveguide uh, offers uh, less attenuation for the frequencies which are greater than cutoff frequency. Now, what is the equation for your cutoff frequency is your cutoff frequency fc is given by 1 by 2 pi root mu epsilon square root of m pi by a whole square plus n pi by a whole square and the phase constant and the relation between your uh, uh, guided wavelength is given by this equation lambda mn or guided wavelength is equal to 2 pi by beta mn that is given by lambda operating wavelength by square root of 1 minus fc mn by f whole square where fc is cutoff frequency for that particular mode and we can calculate characteristic wave impedance by using this equation so for a magnetic mode the characteristic wave impedance is given by square root of mu by epsilon square root into square root of 1 minus fc mn by f whole square and uh, for te mode analysis z is equal to zero from that uh, we can calculate zte mn as square root of mu by epsilon by square root of 1 minus fc by f whole square so i see the difference so once again i'm going back tm is square root of mu by epsilon into square root of 1 minus fc by f whole square for te the characteristic impedance is square root of mu by epsilon by square root of 1 minus fc by f whole square. So when you multiply both under square root z temn into z uh, temmn, it results in intrinsic impedance. So the field components, once again, look at them. Just look at them already, you have studied all these things. Just I'm uh, uh, showing these pictures so that you will recollect uh, how these patterns are looking like. Now well, let us uh, look at uh, one case study where we are choosing uh, the dimensions of your uh, rectangular waveguide uh, B and A like this, B by A is equal to 0.5. Now when you calculate the cutoff frequency for this particular scenario, how we are getting those values. So FC10 is C by 2A, and for lambda c, 10 is 2a. See, this is for, for te, 10 wavelength, and this is for frequency. Now, fc, 0, 1, it is 2 into fc, 10. In terms of that uh, dominant mode we are showing here, uh, if you calculate like this, fc, 2, 0, fc, 1, 1, that means te, 1, 1, or TM11 mode, we are calculating the cutoff frequency. Now, what is the dominant frequency? Dominant frequency in a rectangular waveguide is nothing but the mode which is having low frequency. See, when you plot uh, on a scale, how these uh, uh, values are present, FC, FC10 is the 
one, the lowest cutoff frequency we are having. So this particular one is called as dominant frequency. So in a rectangular waveguide, the dominant frequency is TE10. The dominant frequency is TE10. Now look at these two cutoff frequencies. For TE11, for TM11, we are having same cutoff frequency. These kind of uh, modes are called as degenerative modes. For uh, TE10, how magnetic field pattern is present? It, pre it is present like in loops. T10. See, we have shown some more example here. The dominant mode is T10, and these are called as degenerative modes, whose cutoff frequencies are same. Let us uh, do a simple problem uh, in our examination. Also, they will ask a simple calculation regarding this cutoff frequency. Let us calculate the cutoff frequency for the first four modes of WR284 waveguide. So here you are not mentioned directly what is the size of your cross-sectional area of your waveguide. They have given only number WR284. So previously we have shown a table uh, of uh, uh, waveguide designations. So if I want to calculate the dimensions of this particular uh, waveguide by using this number WR284, so simply divide with uh, uh, 100, you will get uh, the dimensions. So here 2.84 mils, what is a mil is uh, uh, one inch is equal to 1000 mils or one inch is, is 2.54 centimeters. So if you, when you calculate, uh, for this particular uh, type of waveguide, how these uh, uh, modes cutoff frequencies are coming here. See, 2.08 gigahertz, 4.41 gigahertz. So illustration purpose I have given here uh, to in illustrate what is a dominant mode. So if you, when you look at all these results, you can see that the one which is having lowest cutoff frequency is TE10 mode, that is 2.08 gigahertz. Uh, similarly, we can calculate uh, uh, the cutoff wavelengths for all different types of modes or whatever it may be the uh, size of the waveguide. We can use it. Uh, say another example I have given here, uh, whose dimensions are like this. A is equal to 0.9 inches and B is equal to 0.6 inches. So it is not a WR90 waveguide. It is uh, some other waveguide whose dimensions are A is equal to 0.9 and B is equal to 0.6 inches. So these are the different modes we are having. Even though here also we are getting TE10 as the lowest frequency, that is 6.56 GHz. And uh, uh, please remember these formulas. Uh, the phase constant uh, for your uh, rectangular waveguide is given by beta is equal to beta mu or intrinsic into square root of one minus FC by F whole square. And uh, for a guided wavelength, lambda is equal to lambda g or a lambda u, you can say it. Lambda uh, not sometimes we are mentioning. So lambda is equal to lambda u by square root of one minus fc by f whole square, where fc is your cutoff frequency of a particular mode. So uh, similarly, the formula for calculating your characteristic wave impedance is ZTEMN is equal to intrinsic impedance by square root of one minus FC by half whole square. And for uh, uh, transverse magnetic mode, it is intrinsic impedance into one minus FC by half whole square. Again, uh, let us uh, look at another uh, simple problem. You can look at the problem, just uh, see for one minute what you have calculated. See, when you look at this particular problem, they have given length of your waveguide and uh, they mentioned the number of the waveguide, WR90. So your mode does not depend on the length anywhere. It depends on the cross-sectional area only. 
so your cut off frequency depends on a and b breadth and width not on length so here also when you calculate uh, t10 you get lowest frequency so t10 is your dominant mode okay so be, before moving further uh, let us uh, discuss if you have any doubts for one minute and then we'll go for next topic so you can ask me in the chat box or i will ask the questions whatever it may no doubts okay next we are moving to the next unit uh, the second unit uh, is uh, about uh, cavity resonators how these cavity resonators work and look at the cavity resonators and micro strip lines so what is the difference between a cavity and a rectangular wave guide is so your rectangular wave guide is closed four sides only the two sides are open and whereas your cavity is closed in all sides say for example if you go for a rectangular cavity like this it is closed in all directions and the extra component you are getting is z so the mode uh, if you want to go for a, what are the different modes that exist in a, a cavity the resonating frequency for your rectangle uh, cavity resonator is given by fr is equal to mu by 2 square root of m by a whole square plus n by b whole square plus p by c whole square and the mode designation is tm111 or the lowest order mode or dominant mode in a rectangle cavity resonator is te101 so in case of rectangle wave guide it is te10 for cavity resonator it is te101 the analysis is similar to your uh, rectangular wave guide only extra another z component is added to your analysis and for uh, any cavity we are defining quality factor so what is a quality factor is quality factor is defined as q is equal to 2 pi into time av uh, average energy stored by loss energy per cycle of oscillations for a cavity resonator uh, the quality factor formula is 2 pi w by pl and we have taken an example to illustrate how this uh, cavity uh, resonating frequency can be calculated using the formula so ca cav for a cavity of dimensions 3 by 2 by 7 cm with the air field and using a copper material then uh, fr is given by Uh, 3 into 10, 10 to the power 10 by 2 square root of 1 by a whole square plus 1 by b whole square plus 1 by c whole square, where a, b, c are a is 3 centimeters, b is 2 centimeters, and c is 7 centimeters. So when you calculate the resonating frequency, the resonating frequency in this particular case is 5.44 gigahertz. now another uh, type of uh, uh, transmission line is uh, micro strip lines they are uh, similar to your uh, low frequency transmission lines only the difference between the transmission lines uh, at low frequency and this micro strip lines is dimensions the uh, micro strip lines are nothing but we are using a thin strip of copper wire uh, as a transmission line so when you look at the a uh, schematic structure of a strip line we are having a ground plane and your micro strip line separated by a dielectric material so based on the, the properties of dielectric material which is separating your micro strip line with the ground plane the mode propagations will change so in this micro strip lines there are uh, different kinds of micro strip lines you can see here 
couplers, micro strip lines, uh, my, uh, macro strip lines like this and uh, how the field coupling is present in micro strip lines and it is a micro strip line coupler you can see here Now the, this is a cylindrical micro strip line. So the important uh, uh, topic here in this uh, micro strip line is characteristic impedance of a micro strip line. So how we are calculating the characteristic impedance of a micro strip line is in comparison with a wire over ground case. So for a wire over ground case, your micro strip line, uh, sorry. Uh, wire over ground case so the characteristic impedance is given by the formula z naught is equal to 60 by square root of epsilon r ln 4 h by d where uh, h is much greater than d now the we need to calculate effective dielectric constant because when you are using different dielectric uh, materials between your micro strip line and ground plane the properties of wave propagation will change so we need to know that we are using a empirical relation which will give you the effective dielectric constant of the medium so the empirical relation which gives you the dielectric effective dielectric constant is given by epsilon re is equal to 0 0.475 epsilon r plus 0 0.67 and we are relating the thickness of your micro strip line with the diameter of uh, wire over ground case as um, by using this particular equation d is equal to 0 0.67 w into 0, uh, 0 0.8 plus in terms of uh, width and thickness now the fin uh, final equation for characteristic impedance of a micro strip line is given by z naught is equal to 87 by square root of epsilon r plus 1.41 ln 5.98 h by 0 0.8 w plus t so you you need to remember this particular uh, equation so in our examination they may ask you to calculate the characteristic impedance of a micro strip line so another example how to calculate this particular uh, uh, characteristic impedance of a micro strip line here uh, they are given in mills already I have given the relation between mill and uh, your uh, millimeter centimeters relation one inch is equal to thousand mills one inch is equal to thousand mills so when you calculate here the characteristic ohms of the line comes to be 47 45.7 8 ohms And another important uh, uh, concept we have to look at uh, in this particular micro strip line is losses incurred in a micro strip line. There are three kinds of losses. One is a dielectric loss and a ohmic loss and a loss present in the dielectric material. And we need to calculate uh, how much loss is present in each case. Okay, this is about uh, unit two and uh, we are moving to unit three. So the important uh, unit is about uh, microwave tubes, uh, how to generate uh, microwave high frequency signals and how to uh, amplify microwave signals. So what are the main limitations of conventional tubes at low frequency like a transistor? Uh, uh, can a transistor can work able to work at a higher frequency or not? So the limitations of conventional devices at microwave frequencies are main uh, uh, limitations are one is inter-electrode capacitance effect, second one is lead inductance effect, third one is transit time effect. So when you want to reduce inter-electrode capacitance effect at a high frequency using conventional devices, lead inductance effect or transit time will effect may become dominant. Or suppose if you want to go for uh, reducing transit time effect, the inter-electrode capacitance effect will come into effect. So there is a trade-off between inter-electrode capacitance effect and transit time effect. So in order to overcome these two, a new kind of devices which are invented is klystrons or microwave tubes. There are two types of microwave tubes. So they are called as linear beam tubes or O-type tubes. And third one is crosser field tubes or 
uh, M type tubes. Lirene beam tubes again they are categorized into different uh, uh, scenarios based on the interaction of cavities, cavity and the slow wave structure based, cavity based uh, klystron and reflex klystron, uh, and uh, slow wave uh, structure. We are having forward uh, uh, wave structure and the backward wave structure. In the forward wave, we are having a helix DWT, and the backward wave case, we are having the BWT and backward wave oscillator. So these uh, these are the micro tubes we have studied: two cavity klystron amplifier, reflex klystron oscillator, traveling wave tube amplifier. Now look at uh, two cavity klystron amplifier. In a two cavity klystron amplifier, we are having two resonant cavities. One is acts as a input cavity, and another one acts as a output cavity. So the input cavity is also known as buncher cavity, and the output cavity is called as catcher cavity. And each resonant cavity uh, the gap will act as a capacitor and the volume of the cavity acts as a inductor. So it acts as a, a parallel resonating circuit. Now this is the diagram showing two cavity klystron amplifier. This is your cathode and electron gun arrangement and this is your uh, uh, magnetic focusing coil um, uh, focusing your electron beam along the length of the tube. So when the electrons interact with the input RF, a weak RF signal present here, it will undergo a phenomenon called as velocity modulation. So this velocity modulation will lead to density modulation or bunching process in the drift space. And at the catcher cavity, it will become current modulation. And finally, we will receive amplified output from the second cavity. So the three important processes which are involved in, uh, in amplification of um, a weak RF signal is velocity modulation, density modulation, and current modulation. So this is how your cavity acts as a, so when a beam of electrons are passing through the cavity, depending on the signal electric field present here, the electrons velocity are modified, maybe increased or decreased. And because of that velocity variations, bunching process will take place. So let us go to basic equations, you know, uh, how can you calculate the initial velocity of the electron beam at the equilibrium where Ke is equal to Pe. So mv0 uh, square by two is equal to Ev0 where capital V naught is your beam voltage and a small V naught is your initial velocity of the electron beam. So let us uh, go for uh, questions. What is the basic uh, principle of operation of a klystron? So write your answer in the uh, chat box. Or you can uh, unmute your mics and give the answer. Ramesh, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. You can yes, unmute uh, some of the students so that they will. Uh, Four zero three, are you there? Four zero three, four thirty five, four thirty five. Yes, sir. Uh, what What is the basic principle of operation of a klystron? Klystron actually amplifies the RF signal by converting kinetic energy into DC electron beams. So uh, once uh, the signal is interacted with the uh, RF signal interacts with the cavity gap at the cavity back gap with the electron beam, the electron beam undergoes velocity changes. So that is called as velocity modulation. So the principle of working uh, for two cavity klystron amplifier or reflex klystron is velocity 
modulation okay the next question is the electrons in the beam of a klystron are speed up by a high dc potential applied to what elements suppose if i want to generate initially the electron beam for interaction with the rf signal at the cavity gaps how to generate that electron beam Four ninety five. Are you there? No, sir. Ninety five is not there. Not there. Seventy seven. Okay, okay. So we need to apply. Uh, the potential or beam voltage between your accelerating grids and the buncher grids. And uh, another question: the two cavity klystron uses a uh, watt cavity as output cavity. It's a very easy question, right? So it uses catcher cavity. A two cavity klystron without a feedback path will operate as what type of circuit? so two cavity when it is used as an amplifier is not giving any feedback suppose if you give a positive feedback a amplifier is converted into a oscillator right so a two cavity klystron without a feedback path will operate as what type of circuit is it is works as a amplifier what can be added to the basic two cavity klystron to increase the amount of velocity modulation and power output if i want to increase uh, the output gain of a two cavity klystron amplifier what i have to do so we need to add intermediate cavities between input and output cavities the intermediate cavities will go for bunching more number of electrons so that the bunching process will be completed and we, we may get more gain so uh, in between uh, the buncher cavity and catcher cavity we may introduce some extra number of cavities how is the electron beam of the three cavity klystron accelerated towards the drift tube that means uh, how they are accelerated from cathode side to collector side by using a large negative pulse applied to the cathode which cavity of a three cavity klystron causes most of the velocity modulation the middle cavity yes it is right in a multi cavity klystron tuning all the cavities to the same frequency has what effect on the bandwidth of the tube the bandwidth will be decreased yes you are right the cavities of a multi cavity klystron are tuned to slightly different frequencies in what method of tuning so it is a, a please remember this one the cavities of a multi cavity klystron are tuned to slightly different frequencies in what method that method is called as stragger tuning and here we can see uh, the diagram of a reflex klystron the reflex klystron is a oscillator is only having single cavity cathode and this side is repeller so this is called as applicate diagram as you know so here also the bunching process will takes place but in reflex klystron remember that your bunching process will takes place in negative z direction that is in this direction when electrons are uh, 
uh, velocity moderated and when they enter into repeller space they will be bounced back by the high negative potential present at the reflector so the bunching process will takes place in reverse direction so for a reflex klystron the conditions for uh, condition for sustained oscillations in uh, reflex klystron is the total transit time must be t is equal to n plus 3 by 4 transit cycles okay so this is the basic uh, diagram showing a reflex klystron